Now, the latest figures from Saturday show that a further 259 people in the UK died after testing positive for coronavirus. The total now at over 1,000. It feels like the curve that we want to flatten continues to steepen. Just how concerned is the government? Well, naturally, we're very concerned. And um, our thoughts and prayers are with the families of all those um, who've lost loved ones in the last few days. Um, and today's figures remind us how important it is to maintain the social distancing rules that the government have announced. It's absolutely critical that all of us stay at home, that we limit our uh, 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 trips away from home to just one a day for exercise. We limit the amount that we shop. If we do that, we can all play our part in helping the NHS. I mean, it's hard, of course, to know how long this is going to go on for. But what's the government's working assumption for when the peak is likely to be? Well, we're doing everything we can at the moment to try to protect the NHS by limiting the spread of the virus. And, of course, there are different models, as, uh, as you will know, produced by academics, but we follow the best scientific advice, and that advice is for all of us, if we possibly can, to maintain those social distancing rules because if we do so, then we can flatten the curve, we can delay the onset of the, of the peak, and then we can make sure that our NHS, which is becoming more resilient by the day, is better equipped to cope. I can understand, you know, you're not wanting to commit to exactly when you think the peak is going to be, but it does feel like we're wrestling with, as you acknowledge, some wildly different projections. Um, Imperial, for example, one Imperial study estimating only 5,700 people could lose their lives. A different paper said that without social distancing it could be 260,000. Yesterday the medical director of the NHS saying that it would be a good result for the United Kingdom if the death toll was kept below 20,000. I mean, can you just tell us a bit about what the reality is and what the assumptions are that the government is working to? Yes, well, the, the first thing to say is that, uh, that every death is a tragedy for those involved, and we want to absolutely minimise uh, the, the number of people who die, and we want to make sure that the NHS is in the strongest possible position uh, to deal with the, the enormous public health challenge that we all face. Um, on Friday, I mentioned at the press conference that the rate of infection was doubling at between three to four days. Now, uh, that was obviously a, a, a reflection of the latest figures as a result of the social distancing measures that the government has uh, implemented. We hope, we hope that we can reduce the rate of infection. But at this stage, we just need to make sure that everyone observes those rules. Because, uh, again, in a, in a challenging situation like this, all of us have our part to play, and the way in which everyone watching can play their part is, as, as so many, as the overwhelming majority of people have done, is to follow rigidly the rules that have been outside, uh, outlined. The Prime Minister um, today has written to every household. It's, it's a pretty bleak message in some ways, saying that things will get worse before they get better, urging people to follow uh, the rules as you've been laying out this morning. Um, he also said he won't hesitate to go further if necessary. What further levers could the government pull? Well, we want to do everything we can, both to reduce the spread of the disease, but also to support the NHS. And it's always the case that government stands ready, if necessary, to do what it takes in order to reduce the spread of infection. At the moment, uh, all the evidence is that people are observing the rules. If you look at the number of people on public transport, that has fallen. Uh, if you look at uh, footfall in uh, uh, supermarkets and other stores, uh, that has fallen as well. All the evidence is that people, um, in a public-spirited, generous fashion, are displaying the sort of solidarity with the NHS uh, and with other frontline workers that we would want to see. But, of course, we keep things under review in order to ensure that if there are further steps, they can be uh, implemented. But what we have sought to do is to make sure that we implement the right steps at the right time, following appropriate scientific advice. The question was about what the further levers could be. Um, so what are the further options that you're talking about, that the Prime Minister's talking about? I mean, people really want straight answers. Yes, and I think it, it, we, we can take further steps, but it's important that when we're thinking about something as serious as this, 
when we want to um, make sure that we have the right steps in place, that we're influencing people's behaviour in the right way, um, that we are keeping people safe, that we don't preempt discussion of what other steps may be required. But the Prime Minister, the whole government, we follow the advice that comes from uh, our scientific advisors, from our medical advisors, and if there are appropriate steps that they recommend that we take, then we will take them. But it doesn't help those advisers, it doesn't help our preparations if we preempt them before we need to. Balancing out, but at the same time, you're asking people to make extraordinary changes to their lives. People are worried when they're looking at the figures that come out on a daily basis showing the death toll ticking up. You won't tell us what the scientific advice is, what the working assumptions are, you won't tell us what the further steps are that the government is prepared to take. Is there any direction that you can give us on, on how long the lockdown, for example, could last? Well, at the moment, it is the case that, as you say, people are making enormous sacrifices. They are uh, showing the, the sort of public spiritedness, the selflessness um, that uh, uh, is inspiring. Um, and the best advice at the moment is for people to observe the current guidelines and we hope that that can uh, flatten the curve. Certainly all the evidence is that people by observing those guidelines are contributing to reducing the spread of infection. Um, but it's also important to say that the, the scientific models are out there. People have had a chance to look and to examine them. There is a range, as people will, will, will know, of potential outcomes but those outcomes are not predetermined can influence those outcomes and if all of us practice safe social distancing, if all of us stay at home, then the number of people who are being infected reduces, the resilience of the NHS can grow, the NHS can become better equipped to deal with this situation. Okay, the question was um, about how long the lockdown could last for. I'm still not really that clear. Um, Professor Neil Ferguson of Imperial, one of the advisors, of course, the government's following very closely, has said that he expects the lock let lockdown to last until early June. Is that a fair expectation? Well, uh, as I say, there are different projections as to how long the lockdown might last. But uh, it's not the case that the, the length of the lockdown is something that is absolutely fixed. It depends on all of our behaviour. Um, we can, if we follow the guidelines, we can deal more effectively with the spread of the disease. Uh, the models are projections. Um, and of course, we adjust um, uh, our action on the basis of behaviour, on the basis of data, on the basis of facts, on the basis of science. Um, but people should, as the Prime Minister's letter today absolutely underlines and recognise, that uh, the situation will get worse before it gets better. And that is why it is so important that all of us play our part. It's also why it's so inspiring that those leading the NHS have been able to increase capacity, increase the number of beds available, and ensure that uh, uh, we can uh, be in a better position to deal with the increased level of infection and indeed the increased level of mortality that is coming. Um, talking about the uh, NHS uh, in particular, uh, the government announced uh, this week that they're going to be rolling out testing uh, for the NHS workers who of course really are on the front line on the fight against this uh, virus. So when is it going to happen and why has it taken so long for the government to get to this point? Well, we have been increasing the number of tests and uh, I can uh, confirm today that the, the number of tests being carried out has hit 10,000 now um, and we want to increase that, 10,000 a day, uh, we want to increase that to 25,000 a day um, and just last week the Prime Minister, just Friday, the Prime Minister authorised a new programme of testing, so working with research institutes and also with um, companies like Boots, uh, we're now in a position to be able to test more. Boots have opened drive-in testing centres. We're increasing the number of people being tested all the time. And, of course, it's NHS and social care frontline workers who are first in line for those new tests. So when are we going to see a full rollout then for all health, social care and other frontline workers, as you describe it? That is the ambition. We want to make sure that we can test, test and test again because, of course, if we are able to test, not only do we have a better picture of the spread of infection, it's also the case that people who at the moment are self-isolating because members of their family have symptoms, if we can test and we know that they are negative, then uh, we can get them to join the front line. And, of course, it also critically protects the health of people at the front line 
who are working so incredibly hard at the moment and whom it is all our duty to support. So what's the time frame then? When will all NHS workers, all social care workers get tested? Well, we've increased, as I say, the number of tests to 10,000 uh, a day. We're going to uh, move to get that up to 25,000 a day. And we're doing all that we can to increase and to accelerate that. Um, and I hope that we will be able to, uh, to test as many frontline workers at the earliest possible stage. Um, we've been working, as I say, with uh, uh, scientists, um, with uh, you know, the big players in um, uh, providing medical supplies and drugs like Boots and others in order to increase the number of tests that we have. Um, and uh, the UK has been uh, uh, one of those countries which has been testing proportionately a larger uh, section of its population than some other countries, but there is more to do, much more to do. So it doesn't sound like you can tell me when the full rollout will be. Um, many will be wondering why it has taken so long. Um, Two weeks ago today, the chair of the British Medical Association, Dr Chan Nagpal, was on this programme saying about how important it was to get testing for NHS staff. I can't emphasise how serious the problem is. We don't have the luxury of time anymore. Why is it that two weeks on, you still can't tell us when all NHS staff are going to get tested? Well, we are increasing the number of tests, and that's why so much effort and energy has been directed by um, uh, scientists and by others in order to increase the number of tests that take place. As I say, 10,000 people being tested today. That is a significant increase over where we were last week, um, and that number is going to be increasing all the time. Um, the other part of uh, the fight uh, on the NHS, of course, is the number of ventilators, the number of intensive care beds. Um, and I know that the government's been trying to kind of ramp up uh, the availability of both of those things. Um, you started, I think, from a position of having 5,000 ventilators. So how many ventilators and how many intensive care beds are now available? Well, we have available to the NHS now just over 8,000 ventilators. That's because we've uh, repurposed uh, uh, some of the intensive care capacity that we have in the NHS. It's also the case that uh, Simon Stevens, the chief executive of the NHS, has done a deal with the private sector in order to increase ventilator capacity available to the NHS. Um, and we are uh, going to get another 8,000 or so ventilators, including some of which have been um, sourced from abroad, which are coming here from other countries. And, of course, we're increasing our capacity to manufacture ventilators in the UK. Uh, as you'll be aware, we've done a, a, a deal with Dyson, which means that uh, uh, provided uh, uh, all the appropriate tests are passed, we can have an, an additional 10,000 ventilators from that source alone. And there are other companies, uh, uh, from uh, McLaren to Rolls-Royce and others, who are changing the way in which they, uh, they manufacture in order to join in the national effort to increase the ventilator capacity available. When it comes to beds, Simon Stevens, again the chief executive of the NHS, outlined on Friday that um, as a result of uh, cancelling uh, uh, the uh, non-essential work in the NHS and also as a result of uh, the decision to open a, a new hospital in East London, NHS Nightingale, um, we've managed to release the equivalent of 50 hospitals worth of new beds to deal with uh, COVID-19 patients. OK. Now, the Prime Minister and the Health Secretary have both tested positive for coronavirus this week. Um, the Chief Medical Officer is also uh, self-isolating with symptoms of the virus. So there are going to be people who are genuinely very worried about what this means for the UK's response to COVID-19. So who is currently in charge? And if the Prime Minister's condition worsens, who will take over? Well, the Prime Minister is in charge. Um, uh, on Friday morning, he chaired the, uh, the meeting that uh, brings all the effort of government together uh, with ministers, officials, scientists and doctors. Um, and he did so from um, his study uh, in Downing Street uh, using modern technology. Um, uh, we had a video conference and the Prime Minister was in charge. He was the person who was driving forward um, uh, our efforts on testing, making sure that we uh, increase the number of tests available. He was the person who was interrogating the, the forward supply of ventilators in order to make sure that we had the capacity required. Uh, he was the person who was overseeing our support for uh, frontline workers in other areas, in food production and so on, in order to make sure uh, that the life of the nation can continue. So he is very firmly in charge. Um, and uh, later this afternoon, uh, the Prime Minister will also be hosting another meeting by video conference with the relevant ministers and officials. Who will take charge? 
if the Prime Minister's condition worsens? It's a really straight question. Well, the Prime Minister is in charge at the moment. And, uh, Over the, if his condition worsens. I was just answering the question. Uh, the designated deputy to the Prime Minister is the first Secretary of State, Dominic Raab. Thank you. And then just finally, um, to end on a slightly more positive note, um, Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe said to be considered for clemency uh, in Iran. Are you optimistic that she may be able to come home? I pray she comes home. Thank you very much for being on the programme. Not at all. Thank you, Sophie. Thank you.